Cast your mind back to 1998. No, not that. Anything but that. These were the early days of the internet. It was the founding year of Google, and the main doorway to the internet was either through bespoke ISP interfaces or the likes of Yahoo, Lycos, and Ask Jeeves. If you wanted to do online shopping, your choices were far more limited than the likes of today. Even Amazon.com was still essentially just a bookshop. So when it came to paying for things online, you were equally as limited. Most outlets, if they had a website, required you to phone up and make your credit card payment over the phone rather than actually paying online. But online browsing and payment was becoming increasingly popular, if still restricted somewhat. You couldn't just rock up with your bank's debit card, and things were even worse if you were trying to buy from abroad, with currency conversion and the like. This was a tentative internet, an internet which the world was trying desperately hard to catch up with. Let's start with the basics first. There are three important services you can access on the internet. Surfing the World Wide Web. Surfing? That sounds pretty cool already. But also a world where various entrepreneurs were jumping onto the dot-com boom and surfing it. One of those was named Charles Cohen, a London-based managing director of a web marketing agency, the type of business that was flourishing at the time. This led Charles to not only have some money to invest, but also some ideas of where else the web could take us. One of Charles' bugbears was loyalty programs, and in particular, their lack of proliferation. Sure, you could rack up points on your Safeway ABC card or Boots Advantage card, but you could only spend the points in that particular outlet, meaning a lot of spending or a lot of time to reap any kind of reward. So how about a scheme that was non-proprietary, interchangeable between businesses, and really more like a currency than a store scheme? As he worked on the idea, it became clear that this could not only be a micropayment system, but an entire web currency and customer management tool based around what he would coin the butterfly model. Here was the principle. The company would sell beans to web merchants for one cent each, Merchants would award beans to consumers for activities such as registering on their website, checking out a deal, or making a purchase. These activities were labelled e-work. Once the consumer had racked up enough beans from whichever vendors they chose, then they can spend them on products or services at web merchants in the scheme, who would then retire these beans back to the company for half a cent completing the cycle and providing an alternative web currency free of conversion rates, the hassles of card payment, or risk of online fraud. What's not to like? This concept was branded as the web's currency, and the goal was to actually challenge the world's major currencies. With this alluring idea in hand, and along with fellow Oxford University graduate and co-founder Neil Forrester, who incidentally was also in the fourth season of MTV's The Real World. My name is Neil, I'm from Oxford. And I'm currently dropping out of a PhD in psychology, and I've had this opportunity to pursue my true love, which is music. Charles set to work, raising capital from friends, family, and other contacts. Initially, $1.8 million was raised from these angel investors, enough to get the ball rolling. By December 1998, that ball had gained enough momentum to make beans a reality. With Charles initially taking the place of Chief Technical Officer and Neil as Head of Development, alongside colleagues David King as Head of Sales, Philip Letts as CEO, and John Hogg as Head of Marketing, Beans was in motion. Looking to establish the company as a global business, one of the first literal moves was to relocate the head office from London to New York, whilst opening another in San Francisco in order to establish connections and make deals with vendors face to face. Conducting business over the internet wasn't really an option at this point, and so this initial funding was key to establish a strong footing to launch the Beans Currency. 
Progress in these areas brought further investment from private equity firm Geffenor USA, allowing beans to officially launch in the US and UK during March 1999. Initially, this is what Beans.com looked like, boldly displaying the headline, It's like money, but better, and with the claim that you can earn them online anywhere, save them in your personal account, then spend them online anywhere. Anywhere might have been a stretch, but vendors were lining up with the very first merchant to offer Beans being 21store.com. Remember this place? I mean, check out that Scion Series 5 with free power adapter for £329. Nice. By signing up here, I'd have got myself a cool 100 free beans, and then I could go wherever the links take me. Maybe after a few months, I could get some discount on that Scion Series 5, or even a Dreamcast. Now we're talking. At this point, the bean staff numbered less than 100 and were consumed mainly in making deals with other online merchants to trade in beans, which from a merchant's point of view was actually a pretty compelling prospect. In these days, it was costing some businesses $20 per customer acquisition. That is to get a customer onto their website, to sign up, and to set the scene for a potential purchase, or at the very least obtain vital demographic and email data from the registee for future marketing purposes. The Beans model could do the same for less than $5, depending on how many beans the retailer offered the consumer as an incentive. With this, many retailers were quick to actually abandon their own points or discount schemes and jump on the rapidly growing and cost-effective Beans wagon, seemingly proving Charles' non-proprietary theory correct. Of course, to get merchant interest, Beans had to also get consumer interest. This was done by not only pushing a big marketing campaign in print, billboard and online, but also using somewhat unorthodox guerrilla methods under the leadership of Chief Marketing Officer Nicholas DeSantis. A Beans army was recruited to visit cities in an almost parade fashion, dressed up as massive kidney beans, handing out lollies and even slipping flyers into the pockets of passers-by without them noticing. It sounds almost like a crime, but this is what the late 90s demanded, and people sucked it up. All of this not only got Beans noticed in the press, but also presented a fun and playful vibe, endearing customers to this new fun brand, welcoming in this alluring digital age whilst abandoning the old, rigid, established and institutionalised ways of yesteryear. Another hurdle was to convince the Financial Services Authority in London, along with each governing body in future regions, that they weren't launching an actual new currency, as it was illegal or heavily regulated in most countries. This was done by stipulating the rules that beans cannot be transferred from consumer to consumer and that beans can also not be bought directly, posing them as a marketing device rather than currency. However, this didn't stop their London offices from being raided on suspicion of being an unlicensed bank. On closer inspection, it was revealed that the Bank of Beans link on their website was merely a marketing term which took users to their account statement area. However, this link was changed to My Beans going forward to smooth matters out. In August 1999, with beans flying about left, right and center, another hurdle was encountered, this time by a US retailer offering 100,000 beans instead of 50 for a given transaction. It was a beans frenzy, making each transaction worth $1,000. After 1.5 million beans had been collected, a software fraud alarm sounded a bit too late. If you ask me, people flocked to the website to claim a crapload of free beans only for beans.com to swipe them back hours later, declaring them illegitimate. This of course caused anger among users, but also meant beans were swift to tighten controls on their software, especially for vendors who perhaps didn't know what they were doing. By September 1999, and in part thanks to encouraging words from people like Larry Ellison, CEO of Oracle, Beans.com had secured an additional $30 million in investments, including $5 million from Larry himself, and were looking like the next hot thing to conquer the internet. Beans logos were appearing on retailers' sites far and wide, and the catalogue of participating businesses was growing day by day. 
if their online presence was looking promising, so was their office. In line with other dot-com locations at the time, Bean's headquarters was described as looking like something from a high-tech playroom, fitted out with games machines and life-sized talking Yodas. Slimy. But the next year would be crucial in determining the fate of this so-called e-currency. From the outside, the bean scheme didn't seem to have any losers. Retailers gained sales, customers gained beans, and beans.com gained income. However, there were problems on the horizon, and one of them appeared in the form of Whoopi Goldberg. Hey, kid, you don't know what they want because you're old. Old, honey. Give them flus, online gift cards. It's just like money. You send it by email, they spend it at some of the web's coolest stores, and you come out hip. And smart. Whoopi Goldberg was now the face of Flues, a business with similar goals to Beans, although implemented in a slightly different way. With Flues, you could either gain promotional credits or you could buy credits, which roughly translated were gift certificates you could use across a variety of stores. Flues perhaps didn't have a model that was as sustainable as Beans, but their marketing campaigns had drawn interest and perhaps eroded the uniqueness of the Beans concept. Likewise, this was the year that other schemes, such as MyPoints, Netcentives, Cybergold, InternetCash.com, and even PayPal, known at the time as X.com, had started up, with companies like eBay seeking a credible way forward for online payments. Combined with the likes of Microsoft, Compaq, and IBM developing software to take the bite out of transaction costs on small credit card payments, Beans had competition on their hands in this rapidly expanding world of digital currency. However, Beans soldiered on. As well as offering the ability for those under the age of 18 to make payments, with 13 to 18 year olds making up 25% of their business, one of the key selling points for the company was the ease of integration. Retailers could enable Beans payments on their websites by inserting just a few lines of code. The consumer could download a beans counter, which sat on their Windows toolbar, and would count their beans in real time, with website accruement and spending updated as you went. However, increasing competition put beans on a scheme of rapid expansion, keen to secure all global markets before anyone else. By June 2000, an extra $39.5 million capital had been secured by a variety of venture capital firms, and Bean's offices had been opened in Italy, France, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and even Greater China. The only problem was, some of these markets needed to be dealt with in different manners, and cracks began to show in the business model. For example, rather than selling beans directly to a vendor in Hong Kong, their local office, which was run by New World Cyberbase Limited following an exclusivity agreement, would purchase beans directly from the New York office at a discounted rate, and then trade with vendors. These vendors would then retire the beans back to New York at the original half-cent rate, therefore eroding revenues. A similar setup was implemented for Italy through Grappo L'Espresso, and in fact these groups helped inject funding into Beans.com itself. As well as providing this funding, these steps were seen as necessary to get the contacts and make progress in these foreign markets, but it meant that direct sales, perhaps the biggest benefit of this internet model, couldn't be realised. This added complexity and cost into a model that Charles described as We are really running an economy not just managing a business." was becoming even more evident with a project which allowed customers to accrue their points to a Mondex MasterCard, crossing the bridge between a currency only useful on the net and the real world. This rewards card was launched in North America in August 2000, allowing beans to be credited automatically at the POS terminal. In fact, the partnership had developed the ability to even earn and spend beans via wireless devices such as digital TV and WAP-enabled smartphones, over a decade ahead of what we use today with contactless integrations. Beans.com, which had been valued at $100 million at the start of the year, was now valued at $450 million. It had 260 employees and was still growing. At this time, a total of 2.3 billion beans were in circulation, with 4 million registered users and the site getting 2 million hits per month. 
Some 500 merchants were compensating customers in beans, with around a third of that accepting payment in them as well. Income-wise, with each compensating merchant ordering around $40,000 worth per month on average, income was good. But this was the peak of the dot-com bubble, and this model depended on a lot of variables, many of which were teetering on the edge. By 2001, Beans was looking into developing a range of applications and proprietary software that would help retailers gain further insights and analytics from their engagement. But this was a business model built around breakage and float. Breakage referring to the units of value, i.e. the beans, that were issued but never redeemed, and float being the positive cash flow received from vendors between issue and redemption. But the start of 2001 was when the internet bubble was just about to pop. Venture capital had been poured into startup after startup, each at the mere suggestion of a good idea. It was only now that investors were starting to realize that many of these ideas in reality were just, well, crap. Between 1995 and 2000, the Nasdaq Composite Stock Market Index rose 400%, resulting in lavish spending at many a company. It had peaked on March 10, 2000 at 5,048.62. On March 13, Japan had notified it was in a recession that would significantly affect technology stocks. A string of events then followed, leading to much investment in dot-com industries to be cut off. This led to slashed marketing budgets and revealed the problems that lay within. This collapse would continue through to 2004, but led to many fallen online businesses and retailers. This, of course, was a problem for Beans. Even if their model was sound under a growing market, under one where their main customers, i.e. the merchants, were packing up shop, it was disastrous. Customers concerned they would lose their Beans quickly cashed them in, stressing the breakage and float model. At the same time, and with their own growth costs still mounting, merchant revenues began falling rapidly. These factors, combined with internet confidence eroding, meant both consumers and merchants would be quick to abandon the Beans model and tighten their strings. This of course led to the inevitable collapse of what looked like such a promising e-currency just months prior, with the announcement that all Beans would be invalid from the 26th of August 2001, just one week after Flues had suspended operations itself, after unknowingly becoming embroiled in money laundering through its own business model. By the 4th of October 2001, Charles Cohen's dream of a beans economy was all but over, and the business and its underlying technology was bought up by Carlson Marketing Group, mainly for their customer relationship and management tools. Beans may have been dead, but the technology built up over those years lived on. This included their transaction engine, allowing customers to earn and spend beans in real time, their rewards code division, which allowed businesses to reward customers digitally via codes on printed packaging, much like QR codes, and the brand. The old methods of payment, credit cards, debit cards, and the like had adapted, and remained triumphant. Thanks to companies including Amazon developing their online easier payment methods, the old world had caught up with the new, and these so-called internet currencies were as dead as Lycos.com. But the concept wouldn't die, with businesses like Nectar popping up, providing a point system for multiple retailers in the UK, which still survives to this day. And that's because, at its core, it's not a bad concept. Beans would get a lot of grief, even appearing in several lists of the greatest dot-com disasters, but honestly, I don't think they deserve it. Commentators like Kirsten Anderson at Political USA wrote about how stupid Beans were for coming up with a concept which gave points out but didn't make money. But like a lot of people, she just didn't understand the business model. Maybe if Beans had started up after the dot-com bubble burst, they would still be here today. I mean, they wouldn't have ever rivaled real-world currencies, or even created a proper beans economy, but maybe, just maybe, they might have hung on. And I'd be spending 10,000 beans right now on the latest PS4 game. 
And apparently someone must have thought the same, because in 2012, the site and brand under the company name of Beans Europe BV seemed to make a bit of a comeback. I say comeback, but it was clearly a very tentative appearance. Here you can see the site was restored with a crossed Z instead of a B this time round, although why they held what appears to be a design competition for this, I do not know especially after they explicitly specified they didn't want copies of, and I quote, old, similar logos. I mean, how similar can you get? Anyway, coming soon, messages appeared on the site, even a video appeared talking of a mobile app and all sorts, but information on what happened here is thin More on the ground, phone. other than it seems to be Italian-based and ended on the 30th of September 2015, which is a shame. Maybe it'll come back again someday. But until then, that's all for this story. Thanks for watching and have a great evening. Yo, De Niro, the West do come if you get some, you gotta Cool stuff, free stuff, stuff for free That's what it's all about, look, it's like I told ya Any site could be holding beans I don't have to tell y'all what it means Surf it, cruise it, check it out on the net You just don't know what beans will be next I'll bet, put away your wallet It's not about the cash, put away your wallet And fill a bean stash, cool stuff, free stuff, stuff for free From Beans.com, that's where you gotta be Beans up for all, for the beans up for all Cool stuff, free stuff, stuff for free from Beans.com. That's why you gotta search to the Beans.com. Cruise on over. The and there we have the true reason that Beans died. They covered the wild, wild west. God help us all.